Hello and welcome to the Press Study Centre here in Farnham and to Richard McMittis' show, Shaped by Time, which we're delighted to be hosting here. Richard, I believe this is your first solo show. It is indeed, and I'm extremely grateful to the Patrick Centre and you for inviting me to take part in the show. I just can't believe it because we're so aware of your work that this is the first time it's been devoted to you, an exhibition devoted to your work. Yeah, I mean, it's a real privilege to actually show our body of work together. Yes. Um, I've spoken quite a lot about how the works aren't individual in themselves, they all sort of read and flow into each other. So it's really good to show this sort of constellation together. There's a connection between all the work, yeah. and so to have a viewer look around that is really great. I wonder how much the viewer is aware of the connection and how much the connection is, 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 is within you. But I love the, the fact that, that you use the word constellation because I feel them, as, uh, as I've said in my little piece, that they are constellations, they are murmurings. And were you thinking about that when you were planning the show? I think, yeah, definitely. Um, I've always been really drawn to space, yes. both two dimensionally, but also three dimensionally. Sort of, we are physical objects that walk and inhabit the space. So, part of the show, it was really important to have everything in the right position. How we interact with the work is just as important as the, as the work itself. Is there a way you'd like the viewer to walk around the exhibition? No, I don't think so. I mean, I have placed the work in a, in a timeline of how they were created, not, not uh, consciously, I think it's just automatically happened just based on the amount of space that we've had. But it is, it is done in, in, in a timeline, so it starts with my earliest work over here and then progresses all the way around to my, to, to my the, the work I've created quite recently. Okay, well shall we go over to the earlier work yes. then? Do you want to talk to us about this? It's an earlier piece, is it? Yeah, so I created this piece in 2017 and it is called Variations of a Stitched Cube. Um, and it was inspired by uh, two things. So first of all, Sol Lewitt's um, seminal piece of work, Variations of an Incomplete Cube. Um, and, but then also based on the systems in which we measure time, so the number 60. Um, and so those are the two sort of governing principles uh, around the work. And it's really sort of an old set of time. Um, so everything related to the composite number of 60, how we measure time, so 60 seconds, 60 minutes, that sexagonal system um, has sort of governed our lives since the Sumerians, the Babylonians, they sort of devised this system and, and it plays a huge part in, in, in the world today. So really it was about quantifying my time as a physical object. So I set rules and parameters, um, inspired again by sort of those paragraphs in conceptual art where he says that the, you know, all the decisions are made beforehand and then the process of making is just perfunctory. So I set a series of rules, so one hour of stitching on each cube in yes. incremental enforced minutes. So then the decision making is a little bit taken out of my hands. So it starts with the first cube here, here yeah, one hour of stitching, always in the same place, always with the same thread. Um, and then uh, and stitching to a timer, um, and then finishing with the with the final cube over that top corner with sixty hours of stitching, um, and so I did this over seven months of, of of making. It's very interesting. You always start in the same place. Yeah, I kind of like again that sort of security um, and this idea of having a rule and just seeing where this sort of random process of hand embroidery took you. It was about the randomness within a set system and how that might, um, you know, take form on a material. That's really interesting because I know we spoke um, earlier that I said to you that time is fluid and you're insisting on having one of these very set pieces mm. and how do, you, how do you bring those two together? I think um, the, the grid and the cube relates to the sort of modern aspect of time and I say modern, I mean, you know, the last maybe 500 years, the, the, the sort of the need of of us to control time into these more, com you know, like a calendar in this grid format. And it's a way of sort of rationalising the sort of flow of time, um, of controlling it. So there's that sort of nice contrast between the embroidery, which is very rhythmic and human and flows, um, contrasted with the very rigid way in which we measure time now, or try and control it. 
So we've moved now from the, the collection of cubes on the table to something much more explicitly playing with the grid system. Could you talk a little about that, please? Yeah, I mean, again, this sort of idea of recording time, um, unless within a sort of system, but this sort of irrational and obsessive quality about the cube and the grid and the variations that you can get through sizes. I mean, I'm really interested in stitch as a way of marking time. Um, and so each of the stitches is supposed to represent a sort of lived, uh, uh, an existence, really. An existence? Yeah, so that it's a mantra. So every now and then, you know, every stitch is like I'm saying now, or here, or here. Okay. Almost like a comma, or a full stop would del delineate a sort of a moment or a breath. The stitches are, are represented as But well. if it's a full stop, then it's not continuous. A stop, full stop is a full stop. Yeah, I think it's more about um, that sort of comma rather than a, than a, than a final period like this. Yeah. But then also this uh, arrangement of them as well. I mean, they were really inspired by, uh, inspired really about architecture and how time is sort of like the architecture that we live our lives in. And also the relationship to each of them, that you can experience them as individual objects, but then there's that communication and that conversation between all of them. Um, and the sort of movement, I was very clear about this one being almost like they're tumbling around and, and moving. Yeah. There's this idea of sort of constant motion that every time you look away, they might, you might look at them again and they might be in a different configuration. I mean, the, the, I would say that all of them, the cubes on the table, 60, and these ones, they are within their own place and space. Mm. They don't, there's no flow from one to the other. No. Does that bother you, or does that is that something that you care about? No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, the, the, a lot of the grids that you can see they're sort of faded, and there's this idea of this time and decay, almost like dust or dirt is gathering in the grids, and yeah. so it's that um, as I sort of navigate around the city. So the city is there's a constant inspiration, but how dirt and grime and things gather in the 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 grid of tiles or on the tube station. It's really what I'm inspired by, that sort of time of decay, that, that, that visual evidence of time and material change. So even though it's a process, it's also the pattern of time that's yeah. left behind. What's always fascinated me with that kind of fluff and that thing that gets left behind, it's always grey. Yeah, always grey. That's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the sort of the, the amount of grey that you can get within that. So even though I'm using this very black thread, yes. actually yeah. it's all the same thread, but it's that very subtle variation that happens through it? the process. And it's what just is, it's a very it? just a very basic black cotton. Yeah. Um, but it's all those beautiful variations that I find really exciting. Absolutely. I mean one and it's the same for all art forms, but one sometimes looking at your work wonders how you know that's it, that's finished now. Um, I would I'm gonna sort of give away my secret here. Sometimes I run out of time, like it has to be finished. <laughs> But there are moments where um, it just arrives and you just know it. There's a sort of intuition to the final mark. Um, yeah. uh, and, and, and it is about, I know it is about the relationship as well. I mean, I love them as sort of individual objects, but more as a whole story. Yeah. Um, and this idea of sort of condensed time as a physical thing that you can touch and hold. I mean, it's the materiality as much as anything that yeah. sort of almost the ability to hold my own time in my hand because time is so immaterial. It is. And then here I am trying to represent it as a yeah. physical object. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I mean, I, I get that, absolutely. Of course, it's an illusion. Yeah, it's complete. And time is so, it's so abstract. It is. Um, yeah. And, you know, what is time? So it's my time, it's very subjective. And um, Yeah, since you've talked a little uh, elsewhere about how it would be different if somebody else did it. You know, they, yeah. you'd get a different configuration and probably if they weren't so skilled there wouldn't be so much of the mark making mm -hmm. in there. Can we just talk a bit about the mark making? Yeah. Um, if we look at your drawings mm -hmm. um, and stand at a distance, there's very little perceptible difference between the drawings and the mark making on the fabric. And I wonder why why you decided to move from the drawings to the fabric. Yeah, I mean, there's two things. I think, first of all, I've always been, it's about the tactility and the process. But touch them. Yeah, but for me, it's the process. It's not about you touching, but it's about me. 
And so that physicality of holding the fabric in your hands yes. and the physical act of doing it is, yeah. is, is so important to that. And there's something that you can't quite experience with drawing. And I love both. You know, my route into embroidery was all about the mark making and the drawing and those similarities. Mm -hmm. And I like that you've seen that connection because for me, I'm always trying to capture the flatness of the drawing into the thread. But it is about the physicality and the tactility of the fabric and the thread and the action of the whole body. There's a different thing involved. Yeah. Like with the drawing, it's very, just with my fingers, where there's a little bit more of my body involved with the stitching. Yeah. So there's that aspect as well. And also there's the time aspect. This is much slower. So there's just something really beautiful about that rhythm as well that I'm trying to sort of capture within the fabric. Yes. Um, I mean, the fabric, I think, is more or less always the same, isn't it? Um, it does change a little bit. So on, on the sort of, the the, the larger three-dimensional objects, um, I'm using a heavyweight sort of wool fabric, um, but then on the, on the cold piece that we'll speak about later, I'm using a flannel, but it's, it's a sort of a variety of different wools. Um, I mean, the wool was a real discovery, and I think, and I've been using it for a very long time, and I, I like consistency, and because I think there's a sort of, um, there's a principle in patience there that you really get to know and understand the material, and I think, I've sort of become one with the cotton and the wool, but it's the way in which they interact and how the, the marks sink into the wool, which is very, um, it's very independent to the wool itself. And, that, and that's how I can get those different tones. Mm -hmm. um, again, there's, it's so hard to describe the subtlety of the marks and that knowledge of the hand and the material Absolutely. and what I can do with it yeah. through tension. Yes. Um, and so it's that um, relationship there between that material, how you can sort of render those stitches in. They sort of become a composite, they embed into the they fabric. Do. Absolutely, um, you can hardly believe that they aren't actually part of the weave. Yeah, yeah. and I like that sort of thing. I, I like the idea that people might think it's printed and that when you get up closer, mm -hmm. there's a sort of a discovery mm -hmm. that actually there is a texture there alive on yes. the surface and that it's yeah. sort of almost vibrating a little bit, that you can see them moving. I absolutely agree. There's such an energy that you contain in these pieces. Uh, shall we move down the gallery? So, I, I think I understand that this is your most recent piece uh, that we're uh, exhibiting. Could you, it's obviously a map, could you explain a little about it? Yeah, sure. All right, so I made this um, in response to a brief um, for the British Sex Arbonial last year. Um, and it is a map. It's, it's both a map of coal seams. So, um, uh, are those the, the black ones? Or yes, the yeah, seams? they are the coal seams. And it's, a, it's, a back, it's also a map, um, sort of uh, uh, family history, really, um, of, of me. So um, uh, the idea of the piece of work was to chart my family history by looking at my relationship to coal and these underground subterranean um, hidden landscapes. Um, I was really inspired by the idea that, um, I mean the brief, let me start with the brief, was about our connection to textiles and the history and how it played an important role in people's lives. Yeah. Um, and my route into this project was really, I knew that my history um, was very influenced by my family and their relationship to coal mines mm -hmm. and the land. Um, but I was also very aware of um, the textile industry and the textile revolution, um, which really sort of centred on Lancashire, um, uh, uh, and coal was really the fuel for that industry. So that was sort of my route to there. What I just want to say to you is, of course, Lancashire's cotton, not wool. Yes. And you're using wool. Yeah, but I am, I am stitching the coal <laughs> with cotton. Coal. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, but the sort of wool plays to my Scottish heritage a little bit there as well. Yeah. And so Lancashire was really um, the sort of the heart of the cotton industrial revolution. Um, and, and what I did on this piece is it maps all of the coal fields and the coal seams that my family have worked on. Wow. Um, and that I've lived adjacent to, starting off with them arriving in Scotland. So my family were immigrants, they were farmers from Lithuania escaping the, the Cossacks, the Russian Empire in 1912. Yeah. And they arrived um, in Edinburgh, um, they were mugged and they were forced to stay. Um, there. And they started working in the coal mines, a uh, recently opened coal mine uh, just outside Edinburgh, who was supplying the coal for the textile industry and the mills. 
So there's all that connection there with the, the, the mills. So it's the pits for the boys and the mills for the girls. That's how it was always yeah. um, described. So then my, uh, so what I've done is I've charted my whole family. So every, you know, my father, my dad's father, my granddad, my great uncle, everybody works in the mines. So what this does is it charts all those sort of hidden landscapes and really connects with how the landscape has shaped us and how connected we are to landscape. Um, and I'm really drawn to them just because of the, of the aesthetic, the black and white, and then this idea of time, like geological time, but also coal as being this material that, and now, you know, by unlocking that geological time, enables us to go faster than, than our sort of human capabilities. It was really the start of modern time, of the railway, yeah. of efficiency, of us losing our time. So there's lots of sort of deep layers to this piece, really. Um, and so I was born in South Africa, we migrated um, when I was, I was actually born there, so my father and my mum moved there as a consequence of the politics of the 1980s, the closure of the mines. So this piece also charts um, some of the coal mines that I lived adjacent to in, in South Africa, Whitbank as well, where my mum and dad met in South Staffordshire. Um, so it was also a cathartic process as well to sort of, you know, um, relive and understand and be with my mum and dad because they're no longer here so it was also that sort of piece where I could almost inhabit that space and think about you know my family tree uh, so far. How wonderful. What's this black line here? I mean this is just a contour line actually of the South African coast. And it's just a really beautiful line that I wanted to sort of bring out um, and then also on the piece you'll see it's very faintly um, printed but it's the pattern pieces of the miners jacket um, which was um, designed and uh, installed um, in Rugeley, Staffordshire, which is where I grew up as a teenager, where my mum was from. So there was this sort of real mixing of all these different levels of yeah. interest. I mean, it's barely there. It's extraordinary. You don't see it at all when you first look at it, and then you start to be aware of what are these lines? It, it looks like a clothes pattern. Yeah, and, and, and the whole piece was a play on the word coal scenes and the seams of the garments. Okay. So that the seams of the garment shape the garment yes. and actually how like the, the seams of a, a garment coal has shaped our lives and continues to do so yeah. now. So we, we think about coal as the material of the past, but actually even just from to, you know from the events of today or of now, yeah. coal is still uh, a material which continues to shape and will dictate our lives going, going it forward. It does, it does, and the fact that you know Britain was the home of the Industrial Revolution and it was manifest through textiles but fueled by coal yeah. and we, that, that certainly we are still um, dealing with the, 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 uh, the residue of yeah. that. So really very interesting indeed. And, and it was really important for me that I would stitch with the cotton because I feel like the coal and the cotton are so, two materials so linked because you know, one needed the other to be produced in the, in the Industrial Revolution. That was, yeah. the, that was the thing that drove the mills, was the coal and the steam yeah. um, there. And the rain. And the rain, the rain and, also, like and, the cheap, and the cheap labour, yeah. uh, and all that. Uh, and, and really, it was, you know, coal created villages, created towns. It was a driving force for yes. emigration and migration. Yeah. Absolutely. And if we move from the earth and what's embedded in the earth here to the, um, well, the cosmos, I imagine we could call that. Perhaps you could talk about that. So, Richard, could you, this looks like the dark side of the moon or something along those lines. Could you tell us what, what we're actually looking at? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I like that you've sort of seen that. I mean, my work definitely sort of zooms in and zooms out across that, the congruity of the macro and the micro, absolutely. And it is about this sort of celestial and cellular. And it can be anything you want, but there's an intention there that it is sort of planetary and that it is this idea of something coming from the dark side of the moon, like a planet, like a landscape, really. Um, I mean, the piece was really um, derived just by process. Uh, there was no idea other than just to fill the space with stitching and just to see where the process took me. So you didn't have that image in mind? Um, no, I mean, I had an image definitely of a circle and the intention was to fill the whole piece. But I sort of love the idea that 
um, it's sort of elusive and it's, there's some ambiguity there about what it could mean, mm -hmm. um, absolutely. And, and then also the sort of way I've sort of positioned the piece of work as well, that you might orbit the piece uh, to see the reverse of the stitches. Yeah. I mean, I'm very um, interested in the idea of stitch as a conceptual tool, as this idea that it could be a very apt metaphor for us as humans, that the front is very tidy and presented, um, but then the back, this very messy structure, and yeah. that each of the individual marks, these sort of fingerprints on the front actually, so each of the stitches is almost a fingerprint, and then on the back, you can see where the mark has been before, so there's a history um, which is very different to a drawing, so that's another aspect why I like the difference between a pencil drawing or a pen drawing and stitching is that when you reverse it, you can actually see where you've been before. Yes. Um, and I don't work in a very systematic way, I mean I react to the space in the front, so the back is a very messy space, yes. and I like that, almost like a mycelium network underground, all connected. So mm -hmm. not, you know, each mark is not just done individually, it's connected and there's a reason and it leads on to the next one. Yes, I, I, I like that very much, that connectedness. And um, we can see from the back of the piece as well uh, later. I think, actually, Richard, that's probably enough of a temptation for people to come see the whole exhibition. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you here at the Craft Studies Centre. Richard, thank you ever so thank much. You. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.